In this video, I'm going to start out with a little bit of algebra. Stick around, because if you understand this little bit, you'll understand where the moon comes from. If A equals B and B equals C, then A must also equal C. In 1964, with advanced telescopes, we were finally able to see the, the face of Venus as Earth and Venus came close in each rotation. And what they discovered was that the exact same surface face of Venus points directly at the Earth with a less than 0.1 deviation every time. And so Venus's orbit with the Earth's is synchronous. And we discovered that in 1964. A equals B. We know from great antiquity on, at least from the Sumerians and, you know, the Egyptians, that the moon has a cycle that is predictable and that it has been used as a calendar for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The same surface face of the moon, in fact, faces us in sunlight. There is an entire half of the moon that has never been seen in daylight from the Earth. It gets daylight. It's just never facing the Earth when that happens. B equals C. If Venus's orbit is synchronous with the Earth, and the Moon's orbit is synchronous with the Earth, then Venus's orbit is also synchronous with the Moon. And that means they must be joined in a cataclysm. Be sure to grab some popcorn, and welcome to Cataclysm 26. Archimedes and the moon walk into a bar. After the astronauts have safely left the moon's surface, they intentionally sent their ascent stage module, which they no longer needed, crashing into the moon. When Apollo 12 sent its lunar module ascent stage hurtling into the moon, it hit. And the scientists on Earth saw the seismic data. But it didn't do what anyone was expecting. The signal seemed to be going back and forth inside the moon, almost like it was a bell that was ringing. And it went on for an hour, and no one has been able to understand why. The moon rang. Like a bell? Yes, Bill. The moon rang like a bell because the moon is completely and totally hollow. And this little experiment with Apollo 12 was the dispositive proof that NASA sought to confirm its cataclysmic origins. In this video, I'm going to be using parts of a theory originating from EU researcher Andy Hall. But he adds a lot of context to the idea that the moon is a ball of plasma. Predicting the moon is plasma is not a new idea. The case was first made publicly by a scientist named R. Foster in 1965. Well, now, one thing, you have a theory about the moon, and we expect to be able to get observable facts about the moon fairly soon. Um, what is your theory? Well, uh, it is by now rather more than a theory. Uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I stated to various scientists that the moon is not a piece of rock, but it is a uh, plasma plasma phenomena, cosmic plasma, uh, and that this fact will eventually be confirmed. I made certain predictions which were already confirmed in 1958, and the situation now is coming close to a complete confirmation. The inside of the moon is hollow and filled with plasma. So when the module was crashed into the surface, like a bubble, not a cannonball, it wobbled. If you want to know why dropping a nuclear bomb on the moon is a bad idea, it's because it won't explode on the surface and just leave a mess. The moon could quite literally pop. Because if the moon is a plasma, no man will ever land on it. The soft landing attempts will all fail. Please, no matter what we find on the moon there, no bombs. As for the surface material, despite looking gray and dusty, it is also covered in all sorts of glass, including spherical ones and black shards. And in other samples, they found signatures of fission called fission tracks. It's a glass, but uh, in this sunlight, it's reflecting red, green, like the, like a rainbow. Found the first prism on the moon, John. Something like that. This 
this seems to be one of the main reasons. In fact, all these missions talk about this. They talk about this glass bladder and these glass uh, debris um, you know, samples of picking up on the moon, which makes me believe that they were up there looking for glass bladders. They were looking for evidence of solar effects on the moon. And to complicate things just a little more, Gumby, a couple of years ago, they discovered there are tons of carbon ions coming off of the moon. Carbon is indicative of life. Green stuff like you. Over a decade ago, a Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency spacecraft spent a year and a half orbiting the moon and collecting data. The spacecraft was equipped with an ion mass spectrometer, and it detected something unexpected, an abundance of carbon ions, which were distributed over almost the entire moon's surface. The concentrations of the carbon ions were so high they could not be accounted for by deposition of carbon by the solar wind. The Ganymede hypothesis gives us the why Venus was here at all by suggesting the planets formed along filament lines called Birkeland currents. On this string, Earth, Mars, and Venus were the three Gorgon sisters of mythology, and both Venus and Mars had a magnetosphere like Earth. The Ganymede hypothesis suggests that eventually the string of planets collapsed into the current rotation around the Sun we see. As it collapsed, Venus nearly hit the Earth, leaving a scar on the surface 1,500 miles across and 3,000 miles long. In the Herbic Harrow collapse, Venus would have come in from the direct North Pole. As Andy has described to me in his theory, it is that the Moon popped out the bottom as a ball of plasma from a high energy intake. When you add in my work on the sail-like features of the Earth's shield, what emerges are three pieces of information. First, my mast and sails are likely the electrical connection to the plasma bubble, whose formation occurred over, you guessed it, the South Atlantic anomaly. A low pressure front caused an escarpment of the surface of the Earth from the middle out, and that escarpment was full of carbon molecules, and it was pulling this into space. And where I originally thought this was just debris left in space, I now see that this material was being drawn to the very highly static bubble forming the moon. Troublingly, scientists have found water beneath the surface of the moon and have no idea how it got there. Well, if the surface of the Earth was escarped up, the first thing that would have hit the plasma bubble would have been the water on the surface of the Earth that was in the area. All of the rest of the carbon comes from the material that was taken from the surface of the Earth. Since our ball of plasma would have been spinning, the particles spread across the surface of the ball like spray paint, which can be seen in the surface of the moon we always see here in this basin. This is what the surface looked like during the pre-discharge formation of the moon, a mostly dusty surface being sprayed over the static surface of a plasma bubble. Andy talks about a 212 harmonic that occurred during the cataclysm. And while he does not ascribe to the crustal expansion theory, I believe he is right about the 212 in that the Earth expanded until it was slightly larger, just 5% larger, than Venus, making the twos Venus and Earth. Meanwhile, the plasma ball we call the Moon today continued to grow as a natural electromagnetic lever formed along the incoming pressure. The new mass of the Moon pressed down on the electromagnetic lever of the Earth's shield which formed a fulcrum that levered across the triangle of the Polynesian Triangle. And in this moment, it used a discharge to lift Venus away. E researcher Donald Scott explains what happened next much better than I do, but what I've been describing as electromagnetic field lines has been incorrect. What Scott describes are lines of electricity, electric connections that are occurring. The magnetic field does not have a line feature. Electricity does. Back in the 1800s, uh, Michael Faraday invented the concept of the magnetic field line. It wasn't one of his finest hours, but he, he thought that it would be nice to uh, have an equivalent in the magnetic area of, of what the electric field line was in electrostatics. Now, actually, the electric field line is a true line of force, quote unquote, path drawn from a positive charge to a negative charge does indeed show the force that a positive test charge placed into that region will experience. A more credible explanation for the release of matter and energy from the sun 
is that this occurs when coronal loops break explosively. That is due to avalanche breakdown in double layers within the path of the electric current that forms the loop. When the moon popped out the bottom of the Earth, it remained electrically connected through these induced current lines with the Earth. As pressure increased on the Earth's electromagnetic field, the induced electric current spun ever tighter and tighter lines of electron flow into the moon, giving it its spin. The pressure coming out went into the moon, and in that intake, it left the largest crater in the known solar system. Current was flowing in this direction. It was an avalanche breakdown. When the three bodies had reached the 212 harmonic, as Andy suggests, a static feedback loop occurred from the moon, evident in the surface cratering, arced by the thunderstorm-like effects of the electromagnetic discharge in the circuit. I want to stop right here and identify that when Atlas was holding up the world, this is what the people were looking at. There was no name for what Atlas was standing on, because the moon had not previously existed. But it was there now, and aligned with the sun when the discharge happened, placing the moon and the earth in the current synchronous orbit with the sun. This discharge from behind dropped the earth's magnetic shield to 4%, which we mistakenly call the Lachamp excursion. This reversing of the earth's pole while at only 4% allowed the inertia of the Earth itself to not stop, but it allowed for the sending of a shock discharge through that opening between the two planets, instantly reversing Venus's poles and ionizing the planet, sending it into a slow, retrograde, and synchronous orbit with the Earth and the Moon and the Sun. These six big mysteries aren't really mysteries if you look at this from a cataclysmic standpoint. The origin of the moon is the Venus cataclysm, where it acted as part of the electromagnetic lever to repel collision. The water found on the moon comes from the surface of the Earth, where it was escarped during the cataclysm. Moonquakes occur because there are likely cracks in the crust, and the inside of the moon is hollow. This then ties into tidal locking. If the inside of the moon is full of plasma, any time that we align with the sun and the moon, we get greater tides because we are aligned with the electromagnetic fields of the plasma inside the ball we call the moon. The South Pole Aiken Basin Anomaly is the giant inward dome at the South Pole of the moon. And that was created by the pressure which created the plasma ball itself during the Venus Cataclysm. The final mystery are the volcanoes on the moon. There are no volcanoes on the moon. There are only remnants of the plasma arc that reached it. These six questions are actually very easy to answer. It was part of a lever, a lever that saved the planet from collision with Venus. Don't forget to share this with your friends. Click that like and subscribe and leave me your thoughts down below. Peace.